you after Justin's music about the church and after Al's introduction to all these church members, they stole my sermon. Uh, wasn't that an awesome music service today? Awesome. I love it when a theme service comes together. And folks, we're a member of a church. We're not a member of a country club. See, if you're a member of a country club, you have all kinds of privileges. You can do all kinds of things, and people will serve you. But God ordained the church to not be a country club, but to be his ambassadors to change the world for Jesus Christ. That's what our church is. And sometimes we have a mispresentation of what the church is supposed to be, what you are supposed to be. So today, on your bulletin, you'll see membership has its privileges, and I slash that out. Because we do have privileges, because I get to serve you and we get to serve each other. But membership causes responsibility. If you are going to be a member of this church or a church, you have to come into that church with an eye-open expectation that my job is to serve. So today, I want, I want to give you an idea of what membership is all about, what your responsibilities are. And many of you have been members here longer than I've ever been alive and longer than I've been the pastor of this church. But many of you have been a member here since I've been here, and many of you start today. And I believe the church ought to know what the responsibilities are. If you apply for a job, well, the first thing you ask for is, what is my job description. What am I supposed to do? What am I called to do? So today, I'm just going to give you seven points. If you're a member of this church, or you want to be a member of this church, or you're going to move to another state, and you're going to join a church, I believe it's very imperative that we have members that serve not each other, but we serve Jesus. And Jesus loves the church and he died for the church, so we should serve each other because we are the what? Church. We are the called out group of God's people that are supposed to win South Wichita in this area for the cause of Jesus Christ. Folks, I don't want to hurt your feelings today, but I want to. We're not here to come to church. We're not here to walk through the doors we're not here to sing some songs. We're not here to say, Bruce, that was the best sermon I've ever heard. Which you could say that, but I know you're lying. You, you got to do it outside of the church walls. But what we're here to do is to be a group of people that's called out to reach people for the cause of Jesus Christ. And if we ever lose that sight, what we have become is a member of a country club and not an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And folks, our church needs to be the ambassadors in this community for called out Jesus Christ people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says this, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we're all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. But verse 14 is powerful. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. Many members make up one body. We are not in any competition with any other church in this city. That church has its responsibilities to reach as many people as that church can. But my responsibility is to this body. And this body, made up as one, has many members but we should know what our responsibilities are. This church, first and foremost, is an ambassador to and for Jesus Christ. It is not ambassador to, G to Glenville Baptist Church. It's an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And when somebody gets saved, when somebody gets called out to do ministry, it is our responsibility to pray for them and empower them and to love them. For we are one body, but many members. How many of you are more than one child in your home? Like you have two or three or you were more than one child growing up. Do you remember the time that you had a fight with your brother and sister? Not me. I would never do that. 
you love each other, but you still fought with each other, correct? But somebody else fight with my brother, I'm stepping in. I'm going to help them out because that's my brother. And that's exactly what the church is supposed to be. They're going out into this world and they're communicating and they're fighting and they're struggling. They're trying to preach about Jesus and they're struggling. But when they come into this house, what we need to do is love them and help them and encourage them every step of the way. We have a... a Josh Strokamp and Sydney were married yesterday. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> very, very sweet young couple. And uh, it's been a privilege to have them on my staff. You know, I, I went to a pastor's meeting in Springfield, Missouri a few weeks ago. And, and uh, I was introducing Josh to all my pastor buddies. And I said, I hired Josh a week before I had my stroke. And they said, did he cause the stroke? I said, absolutely he caused the stroke. I was perfectly healthy until Josh came on staff, but uh, I had the privilege of marrying them yesterday, and Josh's dad is here. Would you please stand up? First time he's been to church here. And here's what's unique about that. In, 19, in the 70s, I just heard this yesterday, so I'm giving you the, the right. In the 70s, Josh's dad and his family lived over here at Woodlawn, and Jake White, where's Jake White? Jake White drove a bus from this church into the Woodlawn area and picked up kids to come to this church, and they were on his bus, and their son is now the youth pastor at this church. That's the body of Christ. That's us serving each other. So let me give you some points and I know we have a lot of stuff going on today, but I'm excited about this because my passion, my love, my enthusiasm is for this church. I live to serve you. I live to serve God. And when people join the church and babies are born and doing dedications, that thrills my soul. But do you know what breaks my heart? Is when people come to the church and they sit, they sour, and they soak. They get frustrated. They become mean-spirited. They cause division. And I told somebody this morning, I'd rather have 500 people here that love Jesus than have 650 people here that hate God. We need people here that absolutely has a passion to reach this community for Jesus Christ. So let me give you the first one. I will be a unifying church member. A unifying church member. We're all going to have different perspectives. We're all going to have different opinions. But our job as a church member to be unifying, to look at somebody and help them and encourage them. Unity is not the sameness or it's not even similarity. Unity is working and striving together to accomplish the same goal. It's called synergy. Working together for the right goal. And if you've been here very long, what is the goal of Glenville. It is to reach people for Jesus Christ. It is not for entertainment. It is not for Sunday morning. It's that the body of Christ can be unified to reach the common goal, and that's to reach people for Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. We're all going to have different perspectives, but we have to be unifying. That means when somebody is hurting, when somebody is struggling, when somebody's in the hospital, when marriages are falling apart, what we as the body of Christ can do is be a unifying effort to come into their lives and to minister to them. What well, Pastor Al just said, and we get this probably on a bi-weekly basis. Can you do a funeral for us? I've never met the person. And as soon as the funeral home calls me and asks me if I will do a funeral for somebody, you know the first thing that tells me? That they don't have a church. And I, I, I can't say no. I can't say no to anything. So, of course, I do these funerals, or Pastor Al does these funerals. And it breaks my heart because a unifying body should reach into the community and minister to them. But it hurts my heart when they do not have a church. 
So as a body of Christ, we need to minister to them. The second thing, I will not let, my, I will not let the church be about my preferences or desires. Somebody give me an oh no. Because you know you have a preference. Everybody has a preference. And if I tried to run this church to meet your preference, I'm going to be run ragged. So what we have to do is we can't run the church because of your preferences or your desires. We have to run this church as God has called us through the word of God. Let me give you a little experiment. Uh, we'll start easy. Do you prefer sweet tea or unsweet tea? Okay. Okay, and if you make me drink sweet tea, I'm going to get sick. So I, you're not right because I like sweet tea. And we could get in a fight over sweet tea. Do you prefer McDonald's, Wendy's, or Burger King? Well, the, the district, manager for, district manager for Burger King comes to church here. So I'm going to give him a throw out. When I was in college, they didn't serve Sunday night meals. So the, the, I think it was an 89-cent Whopper. It was every Sunday night. That's all I could afford. So we went to Burger King. So do you prefer summer or winter? Winter! Hey, everybody else has summer except for you. That's right. Okay. Well, okay, let's, let's get a little lower here. Now we're going to get into some real issues, okay? Churches have split over these issues, okay? I'm going to throw them out. Which version of the Bible do you like? As long as it's the Word of God, right? It doesn't have to be the King James Version. It doesn't have to be the NIV. It doesn't have to be the Living Bible. The best Bible is the one that you read. And if you're not reading the Bible, who cares what version do you read out of? What we must do is we must be the body of Christ to get into the Word of God that it can transform our lives, not just have a book on the shelf to say I stand up for something. What time of the service do you like? 9 o'clock or 1030? 10.30? 12 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> I'm, a more, I'm not a morning person. Okay, here we go. What type of music do you like? Traditional, hymns, or contemporary? Oh, there you go. Whatever Justin sings, I'm happy with. But not everybody believes that. When I was a kid, the Burger, Sl Burger King slogan advertisement was this. Do you remember what it was? Have it your way. Well, folks, the church is not Burger King. The church is the church of Jesus Christ. And we cannot have it your way. Our church is to be his way. And any time that it's not his way, we fail. So let me give you an idea. We must learn the appropriate differences between these three points. The truth. The truth is found in the word of God. Truth is nothing else other than God's divine word. That is truth. You may have an opinion about something, but if God's word states its fact, your opinion is, ready for this, wrong. Because God's word is always right. Absolute truth. But here's where we can come in. Then it comes from truth to conviction. Many of us have strong convictions about a lot of things, and it's convictions that I hold to. But just because it's your conviction does not mean it's my conviction. And it's not right for you to hold your conviction and say, I'm sinning because I do not have that conviction. Now, if it's absolute truth, we hold to absolute truth. But sometimes convictions are not absolute truth. It's how we believe. Convictions are based on the Word of God, but it's usually interpretation of the very Word of God. And not all of us can look at the conviction the same way that you do. But here's the big one. We start with truth, and then we go to conviction. But here's where most churches struggle. Most church members struggle. Why most people leave the church? Because of preferences. Preferences. And we just talked about these preferences. I can bring up any point about any subject, and there's going to be somebody on the opposite side. As I said last week, it's either Fox News or CNN. They're going to be different. 
It doesn't mean that I can't love somebody and minister to somebody because they don't hold to the same preferences that I hold on to. But when we're a unifying body of Christ, the one thing that we have to be unified in is the body of Christ is Jesus Christ. And if we're not unified in that, we do not need to go to church. A church does not preach Jesus Christ as a church that is dead. Is a church that's a social club. You might as well join a club. Go join the Y. But when you become a member of a body of Christ, we have responsibilities to love and to unify and not be just full of preferences. And then the third thing, I will pray for my church leaders. That sounds kind of self-serving, but I want to tell you what the truth is. Anytime that you're in leadership and you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ, Satan wants to destroy his ambassadors. He wants to destroy the men and women in your home. And if he can take down the leaders of your church, it discourages people. It puts the lack of confidence in the body of Christ. And what we need to be strong is the body of Christ, not talk bad, but pray for. I was at a restaurant um, a few years ago on a Sunday right after church. And guess what the topic of the conversation was with the table right next to me? How bad the sermon was. Not my sermon, somebody else's sermon. <laughs> How bad the sermon was. How long the music went. What version that they spoke on. And I was a pastor, and I sat over there, and I was just thinking to myself, what if I was an unchurched, unsaved individual, and this is the representation of the body of Christ? Would I want to go to church? Absolutely not. If these people are supposed to be ambassadors and they're griping about the very church service they went to, what we need to do is pray for our leaders, pray for the church, and not to be discouraged within the church. We need to pray that they are problems. We need to pray that the problems and everything that we do, God can work them out, not anything else. And I will lead my family to be a healthy church member. Kids emulate mom and dad. And if mom and dad, and I'm going to do another personal illustration, and you may not even realize this, but I can tell by your kids whether you like me or not. I can. When you talk bad about me on Sunday after church, and then your kids walk up to me, and I try to give them a high five, and they walk away from me. Mom and daddy don't like me. But <laughs> now you're going to, hey, whenever the pastor comes up to you, give him a hug. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> but if I walk up to your kids, and I walk up to them, and I love hugging kids because I want those kids to know that Bruce is genuine, and the pastor loves them unconditionally. And I walk up to your kids, and I give them a high five, and they give me a high five. Mom and dad like me. <laughs> I can tell. When you talk bad about me, your kids tell me without even saying a word. We need to teach our kids to be good church members. What does that mean? Well, let, I'm gonna, the point that I really want to get to is down the road, but here's what I say. If mom and dad love the church, they're going to serve the church. And if mom and dad serve the church, I want your kids to come and serve the church beside them. I want your kids to come into the youth ministry, the children's ministry, and I want them to have a servant's heart. And if you give them a dollar allowance, you make them give a dime to the church. Because if you don't make them give a dime, they're not going to give a tithe when they become the church member that you want to be. We train our children to be good church members. And then I will support my church with time, talent, and treasure. I wish that we had investments within the church and we had millionaires coming to our church and we didn't have to have any resources, that it just took care of itself. But folks, this is God's plan for the church. That when you become a member and a regular attender of this church, we are and we own this church. This is not my church. This is your church. We can call it our church. If we own our church, 
Let me ask you, how many times this last year did something break down in your house? Just raise your hand. Did something break down at your house? Did your car break down? Did you have to change your oil? Did you have a flat tire? Guess who had to pay for that? You did. When something happens within the church, we own the church. It's our responsibility. Just for an example, Wednesday morning, our parking lot is getting ready to get fixed. And somebody give me an amen to that. If you want, it's an embarrassment. You walk out there, there's grass all over the place. We can't even weed eat it and can't kill the grass. But starting Wednesday morning, they're going to cut out all the cracks, and they're going to fill all these holes. We're going to have the new seal coat all over it, brand new parking stripes. It's going to look like a brand new church. Somebody give me an amen. But I want to thank you for that. Because last year when they gave me the bid, it was $30,000 to fix the parking lot. That was last year's bid. And we raised that money. But this year's bid was not $30,000. So I need to tell you, we're $5,000 short. But I'm going to tell you this. I told them to go ahead and do it. Because why? Because it's our parking lot. And we have three months to raise $5,000 to get our parking lot fixed. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Just thought I'd throw that out there. We just need to do that. Our time, our talent, and our treasure. What is your talent? What is it that you're good at? What is it that you're gifted in? And if we're a member of the church, we're not here to sit and listen. We're here to serve. We're here to find out what I'm good at, what I can do, and get involved and have passion and love kids. Just like Jake White did driving the bus Back in the 30s, I think it was. The, oh, no, no, it wasn't the 30s. Back in the 70s, he had a talent. He couldn't do anything else but drive a bus, but he had a talent, and he served, and now he led people to the Lord. Now it's, oh, Justin, quit, being a, quit doing that. I make fun of somebody, and you go serve them. But whatever our talent is, you know what the greatest thing is? It's something that we do, and we didn't, Jake didn't any, know anything about this until we were in the office and now he gets to say, God used me. I didn't even know that he used me. I was just driving a bus. And because I drove a bus, people came to church. Kids gave their life to Christ. Multi-generations are now serving Jesus because Jake White Drove a stinking bus. Oh, it didn't stink. It was, okay. <laughs> so our time, talents, and treasures. If we give them, our church will thrive. But what happens when a church does not give its time, our talents, and our treasures? And we've seen this in multiple churches. We start shrinking. We start shrinking because our preferences become doctrine. Our time and our talents become our own. And the church is something that we go to, and it's not something that does anything within the community. And our church shrinks. And what happens is our church dies. My mom was a member of a church when they gave their life to Christ. And at one point, it was doing great. And that church shrunk down to about 20 people. And the average age of that church was 80 years old. They didn't have a kid in the church. They didn't have a nursery. They had a senior citizen's church service. And at one time, it was a growing church. But when a church gets focused on our desires and not on God's desires, the church dies. Because the church is not about you. The church is about Jesus. And if we ever forget that, our church will die. So I will be a functioning church member. Now, a few weeks ago, we talked about dysfunction. Remember that? And everybody raised their hand and said, oh, I'm so dysfunctional, because we're all dysfunctional. But we cannot have a dysfunctional church. We cannot have a dysfunctional church. Our job is to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ, and the only way that we can do that is if we have a functional church. Something that you think about, something that you do, something that you love, we can honor God with. Biblical church membership means we are all necessary parts of the whole. A functioning church means we're all necessary. Tell me, just yell out, 
what part of your body, your hand, your eyes, your ears, your legs, your foot, your toe, would you want to get rid of? If I can chop something off right now, what, what would you want me to chop off? I'm going, since my stroke, I'm going deaf. Everybody says, huh? I, I, I'm going deaf, right, Joe? Joe? Joe tells me that every day. What part of your life would you want to walk around without a hand, without an ear, without an eye, without a leg? Because as soon as we lose part of our body, we cannot function at its full potential. We can't. So the body of Christ that God brings into the membership of the church, he brought you here not to sit. He brought you into the body of Christ to make our church functional. And our church cannot be dysfunctional. So when you have a service and you have a talent and you have a gift, our job is to say, Lord, where do you want me to go? And he brought you here. And then the second question is, what do you want me to do? Because God did not call us to go to church. God called us to be the church. We must do that. Biblical church membership means we are a necessary part of the body. It means that I have to do what God has called me to do, not just to be, but to do. Biblical church membership means we're different, but we still work together. We're different. Many of you are very different, but we are different, but through our differences, we have to work together. If we ever have a mindset that everybody has to believe, act, look the same as I look, our church is going to have your family in it and your family alone. Every family, everybody has different opinions and they're different. The greatest thing about a unifying body is through our diversity, gives unity through our diversity causes the ability to reach people that i am not whether we have to look at them and say we've all had to do this i am not going to fight some anybody have to say that i am not going to fight they may make me mad but through love i'm going to love them whether they believe the same way i do or not in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, and if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members shall be honored. We're the body. When somebody is hurting, when the grays may have to move, they have to find a job. When somebody is going, Jenny had surgery this week and, and uh, Linda Weavers had brain surgery this week. When somebody is hurting and I send out a remind and if you haven't signed up for a remind, I need everybody signed up for a remind. And what that means is when somebody is going through, I send out a remind. And when you get that remind, don't just ignore it. Stop for 30 seconds and pray for the person I've sent out a remind to. Because a church body should pray and love each other. It has to do that. Church, biblical church membership means everything we say and do is based on a biblical foundation of love. Everything that we say, everything that we do has to be based on love. And I read this scripture yesterday at Josh's wedding. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, does not parade itself. It's not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own and is not provoked and it thinks no evil. You hear that at weddings a lot. But you know what this is communicating to is to the church. The church biggest mandate is love. It has to be love. We've all been to churches where from the pulpit and from the pew, it was used in animosity and anger and guilt. Guilt is never the motivation. Encouragement, inspiration, truth, but not guilt. If I guilt you into something, it may last for 30 seconds. But if I inspire you, if I teach you what the Word of God says and God motivates you, it is something that can be a life change, something that we have to do. But then I will treasure church membership as a gift. 
Because the church is a gift. You know, I know that churches have their ebb and flows. There's some days the church is on top. There's some days we have people join the church. And there's some days, I as your pastor, I don't even want to come to church, okay? <laughs> there's good days and there are bad days. But I have to look at the church as a gift. It's a gift that God called me to. And when I understand that the church is a gift, I understand what God is wanting me to do. He is saying this, God himself, through the Holy Spirit of God, when you're a baptized individual, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit that resides in your heart and within your life. And through that Holy Spirit, he's brought you to this church. And when he brought you to this church, you are a gift to the church. The church is a gift to you. When we are struggling, the body of Christ comes alongside and prays and encourages and loves. When you have a wedding, I want to perform that wedding. When somebody's in the hospital, I want to go to the hospital. When somebody dies, I want to minister to you. It is a gift that I can give to you, but you are a gift to me. The church membership, when you pray and encourage, when somebody is struggling, and this is the greatest example I could give. Yes, last Sunday, there was a young boy that just lost his sister, and he came to the altar. And without any notice, I didn't have to point at anybody, I didn't have to ask anybody to come down to pray, there's a group of people that came down and just prayed with him, just encouraged him, just loved him. Tears coming down his eyes, a major loss within his life, and he came to church, and people loved him. Now, when you go through a tragedy, when you go through a struggle, and you go to work, sometimes we hold our head up high and we wipe the tears from our eyes and we act like everything's okay. But a church is a hospital for you. When you're struggling, when you're hurting, when you don't know what to do, and you come to the house of God, you can be yourself. When you have struggles going on, and I open up the invitation in the altar, and you need help, you need God to work within your life, we should never say, I don't want anybody to think negatively of me. You know what? They have just as many problems as you have, but you have enough guts to come down and ask God to work within your life. And God looks at the meekness and the humility of a church. And he says, if you're willing to ask me, I'm willing to do everything for you. But if you're sitting in your chair and you come to set sour and soak and to enjoy the service but not be impacted by God's power, you'll never come forward. But so let me tell you what the church is all about. The church, Glenville, is all about Jesus. But Jesus is all about you. Jesus wants nothing more than to heal your addictions, your life, and your frustrations. He does nothing more than want you to come alongside him and cry out by name your problem. The church needs to be a house of prayer. That's what the called out children of God do. When you know somebody is struggling, when you know somebody is hurting, when you know somebody is celebrating, we can thank God for the celebration. But if we don't pray, we're not inviting God to the party. We're not inviting God to fix our problem. We'll make a phone call to the credit line to to fix my debt, to fix my marriage, to do everything else. And we'll, we'll ask everybody every question in the world. But you know what? who the Savior of this world is? Is Jesus Christ. I believe the song that we sing that Jesus Christ can fix every problem that there is. Here's the problem. You don't ask Jesus to fix your problem. We need to get on our knees as the body of Christ and ask God to fix me, 
to be a functional member of the church. And God puts a smile on his face, and he said, finally, finally, you're talking to me. Finally, I get to work within your life. See, God is not in heaven saying, directing everything that you do and everything that you say. God gives us a volitional will, and we have sin within our life, and we have issues within our life, that God is not going to be a robot up there and say, everybody's going to do the same thing, believe the same way, act the same way. But God gives us a volitional will. And when our volitional will comes into the harmony of the will of God, when we come on our face before God as the church, say, Lord, I need you. That's the smile. And finally, God says, you got it. And that's when the body of Christ, that's when you, that's when the membership starts working out of the grace and the love and the overflow of God's love. So here's the invitation. Do you love your church? Not do you love the pastor. Not do you love the worship pastor. Not do you love the music. Do you love the church? Because if we're supposed to be Christ-like followers of Jesus, Jesus did what for the church? He died. He loved you so much, he died for you. And if Jesus died for you, to become a saved individual because of what he has done. Our job as a church is to offer up praise, offer up prayers, and ask God to bless this church, his church. Ask God to bless the members of this church. Ask God to bless the ministries of this church, the finances of this church, because this is not my church. This is our church. And Jesus is the head. He is the cornerstone. Everything that we do has to be revolved around Jesus. Would you please stand to your feet? I'm going to ask you to pray. These altars are going to be open. If you have animosity, if you have problems, if you have pains, if you have addictions, I'm going to ask you, the only way that you're ever going to be healed is the body of Christ become functional and ask Jesus Christ to control your life. I would like to see you ask God to fix every issue within your life. As we sing this song, let the church, the body of Christ, the called out children of God, ask God to fix every issue, every addiction, every broken relationship. It will not be fixed until you first ask God to fix you and then God can do the work. So let us sing this song and respond as God has called you.